morning, everybody. Super excited about this new unit, Modernism. We're starting off with some modernist poetry. I know we've done E.A. Robinson, who's sort of a transitional modernist figure. Uh, to a certain extent, Edgar Lee Masters can be viewed the same way. He's still sort of a transitional character. I mean, if you look at his dates, 1868, 1950, he's sort of straddling that turn-of-the-century event, right? So it, does, it makes sense that some of his sensibilities are still in the 19th century. I think that's a fair assessment. But listen, we're going to get into uh, Edgar Lee Masters and Spoon River Anthology. I know that it's probably likely that you've never heard of Edgar Lee Masters or you've never heard of Spoon River Anthology, but let me tell you, over the years I have found that students respond very favorably to the poetry of Edgar Lee Masters and especially these portraits, this work that he has created, this imaginative realm of Spoon River and the voices that emanate from beyond the grave as they reflect on their own individual lives. It's truly an extraordinary work. I'm excited to introduce Edgar Lee Masters to you. I don't want to get too bogged down in the biography of Edgar Lee Masters, but it really is important. You know, he was born in Kansas, but his formative years and his childhood uh, were spent in western Illinois. Uh, n near Petersburg in Lewistown, Illinois, near the Spoon River, which is the locale of his most celebrated writing. And so I think it is important and germane that we understand uh, where Masters was from. He's a Midwestern boy, Midwestern voice. He was educated in public schools and he uh, ended up apprenticing with his father who was an attorney and he chose the law for his vocation and he in fact was a practicing attorney for 30 years. Uh, somewhere around 1914, Edgar Lee Masters began writing a series of poems about his boyhood experiences in Western Illinois. This, you guys, was the beginning of what would become Spoon River Anthology. It is the book that would make his reputation. It is the book for which he is best known, certainly establishing and securing for him a permanent place in American literature. He moved to Chicago at some point uh, and was part of its sort of cultural renaissance as well. And some might argue that Spoon River Anthology owed some of its success to this particular time. It was during this period of a, um, for lack of a better term, a burst of Midwestern energy between 1913 and 1920 set right there in Chicago with authors like Sherwood Anderson, Sinclair Lewis, and the poet Carl Sandburg. Um, ultimately, uh, we find that Edgar Lee Masters, like so many other artists and writers of that era, are drawn to the big city, the bright lights of New York City. And uh, he, in fact, does move to New York and devout, devoted himself to um, uh, a life uh, of full-time writing. About 1921 or so, uh, that move takes place. Is this Spoon River Anthology? Well, the Spoon River Anthology, you guys, is a series of poignant and often sort of grim, cynical, graveside monologues that capture small town life in America, sort of its Midwestern values and the angst of modern life. So we have in all 212 characters, a whole cast of characters ranging from librarians to preachers to shop workers to poets uh, to politicians to cleaning ladies. Uh, and through these graveside monologues, we see that all is not what it may appear to be from the outside, that under the veneer of this sort of genteel and benign Midwestern small town, there is vice, there is drunkenness, there is corruption. Uh, the format for this collection of poems was inspired primarily by two 
uh, forces. One, he was reading a series of epigrams in a Greek anthology, actually specifically J.W. McHale's selected epi epigrams from a Greek anthology. And so he was uh, uh, impressed by that format and uh, sought to similarly try to compress uh, a person's life experience in just a few lines of poetry. Similarly, he was prompted by conversations that he had with his aging mother, and she encouraged him to gather the lives of people or types of people that they had known in a series of voices that we hear from the grave. And when we hear them tell their stories, we find that they are memorializing their lives on earth with a vision that seems somehow quickened and clarified uh, by death. It's no surprise, really, that Spoon River Anthology has been adapted for the stage and that music has been added. Demand for the book and for adaptations has continued over the years. It's a very, very popular production. We find it quite often in community playhouse, community theaters, uh, and it is a lovely, lovely thing to uh, attend. If you ever get an opportunity to find a production of Spoon River Anthology, I would highly encourage that you check it out. Takeaways on Edgar Lee Masters' uh, life, his contributions, and really the legacy of Spoon River Anthology. The critical reception really did uh, celebrate Masters' um, contribution. We see here John Cowper Powie asserted that Edgar Lee Masters really was the natural child of Walt Whitman, figuratively speaking, in the world of poetry. And I would tend to agree with that for a number of reasons. Uh, probably most notably uh, similar to Whitman, we see Edgar Lee Masters sort of pulling the curtain um, aside and allowing us, the reader, to, sh to gain access to the common, everyday, uh, uh, individual life in America during this period. And I think uh, similarly we hear Edgar Lee Masters using the American language, the idiom of the American people, particularly here set in the Midwest. And this was one of Whitman's major contributions as well, right? He did not craft poetry in an elevated way. Whitman brought the language down, right, and democratized poetry. Um, and so remember, you know, <laughs> you know, I know I harp on Whitman a lot, but Whitman was so ahead of his time. You know, Whitman was doing this in 1855, and now this generation of modernist poets is beginning to sort of take their cues from the contributions and the innovations of poetry like uh, that of uh, Whitman's and to Dickinson's, right? Uh, obviously, as I've indicated, the book is extraordinarily popular for everyday readers, and it goes back to that point about the language, right? You, you can read it and enjoy it because it's accessible. You don't have to go looking up words. I mean, wait till we get to T.S. Eliot and, uh, and Ezra Pound, uh, who wrote a completely different type of um, modernist poetry. Um, but speaking of Ezra Pound, Ezra Pound uh, proclaimed that at last America had discovered a poet. And we'll get into Ezra Pound and some of the other modernist poets later. We've talked about the popularity of this book. Uh, Masters, though, is a transitional figure uh, in many ways in American literature. I, for me, the poems uh, are modern uh, because we gain access into the interior lives of these people, these characters, right? And in doing so, we find that many of them have been fundamentally broken by the experience of modern life, right? And uh, so th there's, a, there's an alienation in some of these characters. There's a disenfranchised uh, quality to some of their uh, uh, testimonies there at the graveside. Uh, for me, though, and I think this is probably a good point uh, to make and maybe one to end on here, is that for me, the uh, 
the splendor of this collection of poems is a, a, a couple of things. Number one, you can read each poem individually, and the poem, like the individual himself or herself, uh, is independent and can stand alone. In other words, you don't need to read all 244 because that's, I think, how many ultimate poems there are in the Spoon River Anthology. You don't have to read each one. You can just dip in and you can read one or two or five or six or however many you want to and you can have that experience. Uh, but for me, the effect is ultimately cumulative, right? Uh, and it takes on qualities of a novel. Check this out because oftentimes these poems are in conversation with one another. So you have one character who makes reference to another individual community member who's also dead. And then you can go look up that fellow's poem and you can read his take on his life's experience. And you can see oftentimes uh, the hypocrisy or the outright lies that these people have lived. And when we approach the work this way, that is a distinctly sort of modern uh, aesthetic, I think, because really what he has achieved in this, guys, and I may be exaggerating, but I don't think so, but what he achieves by doing this is that he ultimately gives us a novel, right, because it has so many qualities and characters of a novel, but check this out. Unlike a novel that has a narrator, right, or a short story who has a narrator, that voice who is narrating the story to us, we get this novel told to us. We get the communal experience of small town American life there in beautiful Spoon River told by all of these different, unique, distinct voices, right, with no narrator, that's pretty darn cool. And now I'll be quiet. All right, enjoy you some Spoon River Anthology.